That's why J Matthew does not use the euphemism for faith. He uses a euphemism for faith. He doesn't use the word for faith in Greek. Does anybody want to venture what's happening at this point? From a Greek standpoint. We imagine, okay, in Greek thought, we have shown over and over again that Greek thought is a logos to tell us. I should use another color. Greek thought is always a logos to tell us. There's a logos to tell us, okay, if I were to, if, if, if it happened all at once, what would be that, what would that be like? If it happened all at once? That'd be like me skipping right to the telos. And the Greeks never tell you the telos, right? That's why I get so irritated. Right? Because we recognize that in Greek writing, it's a logical argument, and the telos is not stated. So if I jump right to the end, and it immediately happened, then that would be like giving you the telos. In the Greek worldview thought, in the Greek thought, you know, we have this impression that at, right at the end, Jesus took on all the sins of the world, right? Mm -hmm. Matthew is showing us, and by the way, we see this in the other Gospels, that Jesus was taking on the sins of the world from before that point. And look at the response in here. You know, our view is that all of a sudden Jesus took on the sins of the world. But that's not the Greek view. Because Jesus at this point is being viewed as doing what? He is drinking of the cup. And the cup before this, remember what he told us about the cup? You know, we want to take this in exclusion. But you remember about the cup? You strain at a gnat, you strain literally, you strain a gnat out of the cup, but you swallow a camel. Jesus is taking up and drinking the cup. And the cup represents, the cup represented before. What did the cup represent? His blood, right? Because we just had that. We just had the Eucharistic. We just had the Passover. We just had the wine and the bread, right? And the wine represented what? Blood. And now he says, I am, you know, this cup. He's not begging the cup not go to him. What is he doing? He's taking up the cup and drinking it. Therefore, he is, it's not that he's taking his own blood. What did that blood represent? The Passover, the whole sacrifice, everything. And so, from a Greek worldview thought, this point, Jesus is not asking that God take away the cup from him. He is taking up the cup right now. You see, before he gave the cup to the disciples, now he's taking the cup. So the Greek view is, that Jesus right now at this point is doing that logical thing, which is he is taking on all the sins of the world, and therefore his response. Um, you know, I went to him again, can't you watch with me for an hour? So you won't fall into temptation. The spirit's willing, but the body is weak. And he went around the second time and he did it. If it's, you know, uh, it's not possible for this, and he's taking the cup. He says, I drink it, your will be done. He found him sleeping, because their eyes were heavy. And he just went away. And he went away the third time. Are you sleeping and resting? Because now the time when, when uh, the Son of Man is going to be betrayed in the hands of sinners. Rise, let's go. Um, let's see. Where did you say that? I said it. Oh, I, I just want to make the point. In 41. So you won't fall into temptation. Because if he's taking on the sins of the world, what happens if they're adding to the sins of the world? He's got more suffering. Do you see this? And his own disciples are at it. So the Greek, in the Greek, you know, Matthew was giving us this indication. So that from the point of pretty much the Passover meal until his death on the cross, Jesus is taking on that logos. That is, he's taking on the sins of the world. That's the point. You know, we get this idea that Jesus is trying to bow out or that he's agonized. But we'll get indications that he's not agonized about the cross, that he expected it. Well, matter of fact, we'll see that. In any case, um, uh, let's skip on. Let's see. At uh, 47, this is so important that I kind of mark this. Uh, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived with them, a large crowd armed with swords, and that's Macharia, which are knives, remember, judicial punishment, and Zulon, timbers, sent from the high priest and elders, the Presbyteros. That was the word of the day last time. 
Um, and remember in Centurion, I show this group was overseen by the Romans because these guys are carrying weapons and you're not allowed to carry weapons under Roman law. Um, in any case, uh, the betrayer, the sign was a phileo. And remember I told you phileo means kiss. It also means love, brotherly love. So, and by the way, in the Greek it says, uh, I think it says sume, sume phileo, which means a very passionate kiss or a very fond, well, very passionate kiss. Um, in 52, I just want to point this out. They capture him, and in 52 it says, Put your sword back in its place, Jesus said, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. This is a really cute saying, but it's a gross mistranslation, because literally this says in Greek, all who seize judicial punishment, the knife, will destroy with judicial punishment. This is... It is a mistranslation for this to say all who draw the sword will die by the sword because it's false, right? It's false from a lot of standpoints because remember, the guy who just drew the sword, did he just die? And he didn't die by the sword as far as we know, right? I mean, the point is that if Jesus is a prophet, this is a lie. And so it's obvious gross mistranslation. But the mistranslation is he simply makes a comment that all who seize judicial punishment will, with, will destroy with judicial punishment. To us, this sounds obvious, right? The point is, he's making a logical Greek statement. You know, it's, it's not so unusual from that. I just want to point that out to you because I, it just always irritates me that that's, you know, that's one of the things that people always say to Jesus, you know. Um, the guy who said that if you, if you break the Torah or teach anyone to break the Torah, that you should have a millstone tied around your neck, that Jesus is against violence because he makes a statement. And there's no statement at all in the New Testament that would indicate that Jesus ever was against appropriate violence. But in any case, that's another problem. Um, and then, do you not think that I can't call my father and he will at once dispose of 12 legions of angels? Do you remember the angels? Uh, we'll see angels. Um, Jesus is telling us, telling them basically who he is, that, you know, I am the Son of Man, and it's just a repeat. Um, but how then will the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen this way, etc., etc.? And then the whole point is in 56, but all this has taken place that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled. And then all of his disciples deserted him and fled, just as was predicted. And they regressed him, took him to Caiaphas. Let's see, I need to skip, 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 but let's go, let's see. Um, in 61, they declared, this fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. Okay. That's all they can get? I mean, what do we think? It's nuts. Well, you know, to the Greek rational audience that's reading this in Greek, what do you think they say? They're nuts, right? Then the high priest stood up and said, are you not going to answer? <laughs> what is this testimony these guys are bringing against you? You know, you should be laughing because, you know, this is, that's the point. These are stupid arguments, right? This is a D-rash. These are D-rash arguments. They're silly, okay? They're absolutely silly. Jesus remained silent. The high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Now, here's a question that Jesus will answer. Listen to what he says. 64, yes, it is as you say. But I say to all of you, in the future you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. And I think this is very appropriate that today the lesson from Stephen in, the, in Acts, what did Stephen say? I see Jesus at the right hand of God the Father because that is the whole of our idea and the New Testament idea. So remember, he said within a generation. Let's see what happens. Um, high priest tore his clothes. He says he spoke in blasphemy. Again, to a Greek audience, they'd say, okay, what's the deal? But in any case... Um, Blasphemy by his own words, he claimed to be the Messiah, the Christ, and he'd been, you know, proclaiming this forever. And what do you think? He's worthy of death, they answered. Again, to a Greek thought, this is just silly. But in any case, um, you know, what this is, is again, 
Matthew, as a good writer, is trying to show us an irony. He's giving us an irony. He's giving us a, an obvious irony. The irony is, obviously, this is, these are silly you know, accusations. They're not intended to be reasonable nor rational accusations. They are dirash accusations, and Jesus himself, this allows, you know, you, know, you look at it one way. Artistically, this allows Jesus to make the claim before them, and so therefore, it's set in stone. Right? They condemned him to death for him stating, and if you remember, remember back before, what did it say? You kill the prophets. You're like tombs that have corruption inside, whitewashed marble on the outside. Remember all that? Mm -hmm. That's the point. This is the irony. Remember that irony? I told you, every single statement in that irony would come true. Do you see it coming true right here? They're about to kill a prophet who claimed to be the Son of Man, claimed to be the Messiah. And this goes directly back to the irony chapter. Um, all right, then they go on, and he's got the, he has the, you know, Peter doing his thing. Then 27, in the early morning, they brought him to the, they bound him and handed him over to Pilate, because the Sanhedrin didn't have the authority to put anyone to death. Only the Romans had that authority. And only that, you know, Jesus was kind of too big of a fish to kind of have an accident. You know, everybody knew he was there, so they just could, you know, oops, he had an accident, he fell down. Um, they couldn't get away with that. And he wasn't a Gentile, so they couldn't do like they did to poor old Stephen. Stephen was a Gentile convert, right? That's why he had a Jewish name, or a Gentile name, a Greek name. So, you know, you can croak a Greek, that's all right, but you can't get away with that for a Jew in this time. In any case, uh, that's when old Judas did his thing. I just skip, skip, skip. Let's go see. Um, meanwhile, Jesus in 11 stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus is willing to answer this question. Yes. Yes. Straightforward answer. Um, What's interesting is in, in John, it's an ego emi statement, but I don't have time to get into that detail. But in any case, are you the Messiah? And the second one is, are you the king of the Jews? These are the two questions that Matthew wants to ensure in, well, the, answer, in the Logos. The answer he gave here and also the answer he gave to the Sanhedrin, it, when you read it, it sounds kind of flip. Well, you say so. It's no. Like um, in, the thing is that this is a Hebrew, this is a rendering in Greek. Greek absolutely concrete. So when it, he says, yes, it is as you say, that means <coughs> not only yes, but yes. And the reason that Matthew says it this way is he can't say ego emi because he doesn't. Only John has got guts enough to say ego emi. Ego emi is I am, which is an absolute declarative statement in Greek that is beyond a shot of a doubt. Matthew is too good a Greek scholar to use ego emi. He will not do it. Matter of fact, the guy, he, maybe he wanted to put it in, but the grammateus that was writing it wouldn't write it. Because ego emi is, is just a radical statement in Greek. And so Jesus' statements are emphatic in Greek. Is it an iron like Jehovah? Yes. It's a, it's a statement, of, but in Greek, in Hebrew, I am is, a, is saying you are God, basically. You don't ever say I am in Hebrew. But likewise, in Greek, in ancient languages, they tend not to use the I am construction, where in English we tend to use it all the time. Yeah, Real quick, I don't want to backtrack too much. No, that's right. On the, uh, <clears throat> and we're, we're assuming it's Peter, we're told later in different gospels, it is sliced off the earth with a sword, a knife. Yeah. How did he get a hold of that? And why wouldn't he hum him right on the spot? Well, possessing weapons? <laughs> I don't disagree. I think that's uh, a great question. They were allowed to have daggers of different sizes, you know, and basically the Romans tried to keep anything out of their hands that was long. And the word macarina, which is, or macara, which is used in both of these, you know, contexts, could be, it, it's not a knife, it's not a sword, you know, and it's small. It can be bigger or small. And they mentioned in one of them that it's a fish knife. And, a, and specifically a fish knife would have been a short bladed knife you know, of not huge size. So, you know, maybe that was in the legal, right? I mean, okay. in, in our country, we even have legal limits, supposedly for knives. And I think I've got one that's totally illegal that the military used to have and carry all the time, but that's <laughs> another question. Um, in any case, let's see. Um, they, uh, basically, Pilate tells him to, uh, to crucify him. 
Uh, let's see, is there anything big time in here? Uh, no, I didn't mind anything sp spectacular. There's some really good stuff in some of the other ones that are really greatly detailed. Um, I'll mention those when we get to it. Uh, they degraded Jesus just like a king. They put, uh, they put crown of thorns on his head. They put a robe on his head. This is typical mocking. This is not atypical. And this was done, you know, when you crucified a person as a king. Yes, sir? One thing I'm not zero on is the relationship between the Jews and Caesar. Caesar was not considered a king. So that, so that it's possible that some of the other subjects could have a king. And Caesar just over everybody. <coughs> How did that go? You know, because that Pilate didn't think he was uh, being uh, treasonous to set on the king of the Jews. That was fine with Pilate, apparently. Well, okay, the way it works is this. And, you know, in ancient history, this is absolute ancient, this is ancient history stuff. So in the ancient world, you know, Caesar is Caesar, and under Caesar, there are numerous kings. Okay. Every city state had either a king. Or a procurator, or a uh, governor. You know, they call him a governor. He's really a procurator. He has someone that is given the authority. For example, Pilate, a member uh, in extensia of the Senate, as a procurator of Rome, represents Caesar. On the other hand, Herod rules through a delegation of authority from Caesar. Both of them have certain legitimate authorities. Both have certain legitimate responsibilities. And so, under Caesar are all these guys. And so, for Jesus to make a king, or make a claim of king, he's not claiming to be Caesar, he's simply making a claim to be king of the Jews. Right. And, uh, yeah, that's an issue. Because right now, Pilate's a procurator, and Pilate can croak him for that reason. You know? But he chose, he, he chose not to at this point. Well, to him, it was kind of a joke. Yeah. I mean, I think Pilate took it seriously, because he had him killed. Well, that's well, pretty well, serious, right? But he also right? made him leave that way on the cross. That's, that's a point I want to get to. It's really interesting because we see this even more in, for example, John, where, he, where Pilate, when the minute Christ says, Ego Imi, the king of the Jews, and Pilate goes, you know, you can see that in the, verb, in the verbiage that's used in John. We don't see that quite as strongly in the verbiage used, you know, in the, in the language used in Matthew. But Matthew's point isn't, that's not his point. Matthew has only two points he wants to make here. He wants to point out that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and claims to be the Messiah in an official court. And then secondarily, he wants to show that in a political court, in an ecclesiastical court, he claims to be the Son of God, the Messiah. But in a, a secular court, a political court, he claims to be King, King of the Jews. See? This is a Logos of Telos. This is something we kind of miss because we want to look at, oh, this is a nice story. But it's not a nice story. This is... Matthew was trying to show us some very, very important things. And that's not to say this didn't occur. The Gospels show us historically it occurred. It's just that in the Greek documents, the Greek documents are more intense about telling you the point of why it occurred through this Logos to tell us argument, as opposed to they're not trying to write, and you know, Luke was. Luke was trying to write a witness account, eyewitness account. Matthew's giving you an eyewitness account, but his focus is the logos to tell us of the point of why Jesus was before an ecclesiastical than a secular court. See, that's the point. Um, then they, uh, they crucified him before. The typical, uh, Matthew does not give us the details of the crucifixion, okay, at all. Um, doesn't give us any of those details. The way, you know, in the way that he would be crucified, he could have been crucified with nails. It doesn't tell us, does it? doesn't tell us the nails at all, right? Um, it does tell us, I want to point this out. This is very important. They came to Golgotha, the place of the skull. They offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall, but after tasting it, he refused to drink it. Why did he not drink it? It's a painkiller. Pain because we know in the other Gospels, not in Matthew, we know from the other Gospels that they did crucify him like a king because they used nails, which the nails would have been pegs made of wood. They did not use nails out of iron. Um, to crucify people because it's too costly, unless they provided it, I guess. Because one example we have, there are some nails in the guy's actual uh, iron nails, the only crucifixion victim that we know of. But they did not use it because of cost. Nails were expensive, especially for a guy like Jesus. So the reason they did that was to, so that they wouldn't move their arms and it would you know, break an artery because then they would die immediately and you didn't want that to happen. 
and in, in Centurion, I give this a lot of detail on that. But the point is this, that if Jesus was afraid of the cross and afraid of the pain of the cross, what would he have done? He would have drunk it. But he wasn't. You know, he didn't drink it on purpose. He was not afraid of the cross. He was not afraid of what he had decided to do, right? And so that gives further credence. That's what that, and, and by the way, you notice drinking wine and myrrh and taking the cup and then the cup of the Passover meal. Do you see this? This should never be lost on us. Matthew did not write these things just to write them that way. The reason he used cup instead of faith is because he was telling us something very important. The reason he points out that they offered him, you say, why did, why did he even mention if he didn't take it? Because it's symbol that points back to the cup, that points back to the, the blood, you know, the... The wine, yeah. It always seemed kind of ironic. The, the Romans were always very good at torture and making people suffer. And the fact that they put the uh, nails in it to keep it from tearing an artery means they wanted them to suffer for a long period of time. So yeah. why would they even offer something to kill the pain? So they wouldn't jump. When you, when you hold them, you don't, you know, when you're doing like that kind of surgery, especially with a wooden peg that's between the ulna and the radialis, it's not in the hand. That's bogus. No one can be crucified in the hand or in the feet. That's impossible. I can prove it to you. Let's try it on you. Um, you have to put it between the ulna and the radialis, and there's an artery that runs down the side there. And so when, when you're trying to peg a guy with a blunt peg through their skin, you do not want them moving too much. So that's why you'd have two guys, one on either side, holding him, and you like them to be drugged. And as I showed in Centurion, you probably put a tourniquet above their arms so that in case you did hit the artery, you could just leave the tourniquet there. And that way, they wouldn't die quickly. You don't want to die too quickly, you know. That would be terrible. Um, but the Romans weren't, you know, the Romans were actually pretty crying in this era. There's a lot worse things to do. In other words, okay, we'll keep going. The two robbers, they weren't robbers. Uh, they weren't thieves. They were brigands. They were probably, and I talked about that last week. I won't add to that. Um, let's see. I'm going to keep going here. Uh, at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice. He, uh, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is a mixture of Aramaic and Hebrew, which also again proves that Jesus spoke mostly Greek, because otherwise why quote him? At this point, he's not dead. He's in the process of take, he is in the process, it's the end of the process of taking on all the sin of the world. And notice what they do. Let's see, where does it say it? Okay, 48. Immediately... One of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar and put it to the stick and offered it to Jesus to drink. What does that indicate? The cup. You see? The cup. In other words, at this point, Matthew is telling us that Jesus has taken on all the sin of the world. God did not forsake him God is God of the universe, but God himself can't look on sin. That's an Old Testament idea. And so therefore, that's the end. And Matthew certifies it with a cup. Now, I guess that's the bell. Um, I don't have time to go to the other things. But in any case, the big deal is, this isn't the end of the story, because at the end, the resurrection. And remember, if you look at this in a Greek standpoint, go look at the image, look at the symbols, Look at how they trace through. Look at the endpoints in the terms of the, of the sequence of events. And see how everything focuses back on the Sermon of the High Place and all the discourses. And so we can say, and this is why I gave you the conclusion, because the point of the conclusion is that this is a five-part argument formed by the discourses. You look at the five discourses. The narratives are the discourses. They all point back to the Sermon on the High Place. They all point back. They're all increasing Logos to Telos type arguments that we talked about before. And the end point is, the whole point of Matthew is proven by the resurrection of Christ. The Jurio of Necros. And so that's the point. So what we see in Matthew, the whole of Matthew, is that it is a complete and cohesive Logos to Telos Greek document that leads from the birth of Christ, telling us who he is, to the end and the death of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, 
telling, you know, proving who he is. And that's the point. And that's a good Greek guy. In any case, thank you, Father, for your word. We pray that you continue to look out to this week. We pray this in your son's blessed and holy name. Amen. So we won't have class again until the second week of January.